Hello, this is Dickie Arbiter in London. And I'm Victoria Arbiter in New York, and you're watching Royal Report. Born at Buckingham Palace on March 10th, 1964, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Edward, Anthony, Richard, Louis, just turned 60. The fourth and last of the late Queen Elizabeth II's children, he was born third in line to the British throne at the time of his birth. Today, he stands at number 14. Though his public engagements rarely get much attention from the press, still he is a committed member of the working royal family. Now, Dad, time constraints alone mean that we are not going to get into a full biographical piece about the Duke of Edinburgh, but I think it would be helpful to touch on his childhood. Prince Philip was in the room when he was born. He hadn't been for his previous children, but it's often said that Prince Edward along with his brother, the Duke of York, was part of the Queen's second family. What's meant by that? Well, what is meant by that, the second family, is the first family were born in 1948 and 1950, respectively. That's King Charles III in 1948 and the Princess Royal, Princess Anne, in 1950. Then the Queen, after her coronation in 1953, was travelling ad nauseum. Uh, she was, did a six-month tour of the Commonwealth. Everybody expected within the Commonwealth, because a lot of them were still uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the monarchy, I suppose, uh, monarchy as head of state, uh, for a considerable number of years until the 1960s, till they start break, breaking away. So the Queen was doing a lot of travelling, and then things sort of slightly wound down uh, in the late 1950s, and they decided on a second family. So Adri Andrew came along in 1960 and Edward in 1964. And that is what is meant by the second family. I think it's probably fair to say as well that by that stage, when her second two sons came along, the Queen was much more relaxed in her role. She was respected worldwide. She'd really settled into what was expected of her. And so unlike with Charles and Anne, who you previously mentioned, she was sort of able to get home in time for bath time and tuck them into bed, whereas she was able to be as hands on, I guess, as, as a queen, as a reigning queen could be with the younger two. She was very much hands-on with the second family. You've got to remember that when Charles was born in 48 and Anne in 1950, the, their grandfather, King George VI, was extremely ill. He'd had a number of operations. He did have cancer, which meant that their mother, then Princess Elizabeth, was very much committed to supporting her father and standing in for her father. So they didn't see much of her. She tried in the morning to see them uh, around about breakfast time. She tried in the evening when they were just before going to bed. But it was extremely difficult because there were big demands of her, uh, which meant that they took her away from Buckingham Palace. Well, not so much Buckingham Palace, but from Clarence House, where they were living, um, to, to do the job. And it was very unfortunate. And the king did kind of complain about that in later years. But his stance towards his mother very much softened as he got older and she got older. A number of biographies published over the years have said that, contrary to popular belief, and we like busting myths on this show, that Prince Edward was actually quite close to his father, more so than, than a lot of people have come to believe. Um, Ingrid Stewart, in one of her books, said that they used to go shooting regularly together. But in 1986, having graduated from Cambridge University, Prince Edward joined the Royal Marines. He was not there very long. I think he completed maybe less than a third of the course before dropping out in January 1987. The press had a field day with this. Prince Philip at the time was Captain General of the Royal Marines. They said he was outraged, he was angry. I would have been quite small at the time. And I remember everyone talking about how cross Prince Philip was with his youngest son. But Prince Edward later said that actually his father was incredibly supportive of his decision. His father was supportive of his decision, rightly say that uh, Prince Philip was Captain General of the Royal Marines. He did actually warn his son about going into the Royal Marines because it is tough. Um, you've got to be a certain type of person, a certain type of makeup to go into something like the Royal Marines, even the SAS or the Parachute Regiment. So they are, and they require 
toughness. Edward didn't have that toughness, but I think he wanted to impress his dad. He did it for his father. He was already slightly involved with the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, learning the ropes, um, and he wanted to, to impress his father. And while the media were having a field day saying, well, the family are angry with him, he should never have done it, his father was very supportive, and very supportive of the things that he went on to do afterwards, all the time supporting his dad with the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. After the Marines, and I love that we can put that out there because Prince Philip is often sort of portrayed as a, as a bit of a bully and a hardline father, but it's those moments where we come to understand that actually, no, he was just a dad trying to support his children. Um, but uh, Prince Edward has talked about how he loves the razzmatazz, I love that he even used that word, of the theatre. And much like his oldest brother, King Charles III, he has been a tremendous champion of the arts. Um, he loves it, whether it's the ballet, the opera, uh, theatre, all of that. And so upon leaving the Marines, it was quite a 180 when he went to work for Andrew Lloyd Webber. And I love it when little tidbits come to the forefront. I didn't know this, actually. Um, again, I was far too young at the time, but uh, he had commissioned in 1986 a musical called Cricket from Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice, which was for his mother's 60th birthday celebration. But because of that connection to Andrew Lloyd Webber, he ended up working for the really useful group. He loved it. And from there, he went into television production production and I don't want to sort of floss over all of this too too quickly I am conscious though uh, of time and we've got 60 years to cover here but from there uh, really sort of another pivotal moment in Prince Edward's life was the inception of Ardent which was his uh, production company it was widely ridiculed by the press because that's what the press likes to do some of the programs that he made certainly there was a documentary he made on his uncle uh, great uncle uh, King Edward VIII um, who abdicated that did very very well in the US. It was incredibly well received. It got a bit of grudging respect in the UK. But of course, Edward was accused of capitalising on his royal connections. He was accused of capitalising on his royal connection, uh, connections. Unfortunately, he cast the rod for his own back, because when he started up Ardent, he said he wouldn't make use of his royal connections. And unfortunately, he did, because most of his programmes did have a royal theme to them. As you rightly say, his Edward on Edward was very well received, not just in the United States, but also in the UK. But he was getting a hard time from the British networks. They felt this upstart had no right in creating a television production company. And yet he did do some jolly good programmes, uh, and they were well received, both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and I remember one programme that he did and it went on the UK's Channel 4. Uh, it was very good but it came off because there were all sorts of grumbles. It was called Annie's Bar. It revolved around the Palace of Westminster to our uh, American uh, visitors. That's the Houses of Parliament, both the Commons and the Lords uh, and Annie's Bar being what it is, a bar where all the MPs would hang out and gossip and flirt. Um, and it was well received and it was very good, but unfortunately it died a death because it was on Channel 4. Its viewership is not very high, although they do produce some incredibly good programmes, but the, everything is geared to viewership. If the viewers are there, the advertisers are there. If the viewers aren't there, the advertisers aren't, and the programme gets ditched. But he did do some good programmes. The last one, if I remember rightly, was the restoration of Windsor Castle, uh, and that was after the fire. Now, I remember we were touting around all the networks trying to get somebody to make a restoration documentary. It would have been a five-year commitment. Initially, the BBC took it. After six weeks, they said, no, we're not going to commit ourselves to five years. And I thought, oh, goodness, what are we going to do? So we carried on filming ourselves and filming the restoration probably every two or three weeks, just to see the progress. So we had a lot of material in the can by the end of that five years. There was an occasion where a state arrival lunch and Prince Philip came up to me and said, what are you doing at Windsor Castle? I said, well, we were filming the restoration. Well, that was a waste of time, he said grumpily, because you haven't got the initial stuff, which was filmed by the BBC. I said, actually, we have, because we told, I told the BBC, it's ours, not theirs. It's our castle, not their castle. So we have the footage. And he sort of harumphed them. And walked off. This is Dickie Arbiter in London. And I'm Victoria Arbiter in New York. 
Dad and I are thrilled to be back on YouTube and we are so excited to see that we have just soared past 6,000 subscribers. So thank you all so very much to all of you who have subscribed. We really do appreciate your continued support. If this is your first time here or you haven't done so already, please do subscribe now. By doing so, you'll help the channel continue to grow significantly, which will allow us to bring you even more fact-filled content on Royal Report. Without your support, we just can't do it. So we've set ourselves a target of 10,000 subscribers. Look down at the bottom of the screen. How do you think we're doing? Please click on the subscribe button now. There's no cost to you because subscribing is absolutely free. And don't forget, you can also click on the little bell, which means that new episodes will be sent direct to your homepage. Thank you so much. We are thrilled and grateful to welcome each and every one of you to our Royal Report Club. We'll see you next time on Royal Report. Edward did do some jolly good programs, um, uh, and unfortunately, what we had was, and you're going to go on to the Duchess of Edinburgh in a, in a moment, we had a sting in 2001. I'd already retired from the press office, but I was called back again because they were short-staffed. And the day I arrived, I was told and asked to go and look after the Countess of Wessex, as she was then, now the Duchess of Edinburgh, to... Um, uh, just guard her against the news of the world. And I said, news of the world, what are they doing there? He said, well, she got caught in a sting. The news of the world came along and said, well, we've got the story. We won't run the story if, uh, if we get something from you. And then the sort of PR guy who'd been brought in for a short term contract um, sold the idea to the Countess of Wessex to do an interview with the news of the world. So she did an interview, they got a photograph, and the headline on the, on the Sunday was My Edward's Not Gay, in sort of three-inch banner headlines. Terrible headline. Why he did that, I really don't know. But it was a trade-off. We won't run the story, you give us an interview. Well, what happened was, and it's going to be very quick now, the Daily Mail uh, had also been offered the story. They felt that the... Uh, uh, the news of the world, as was at the time, had um, broken a deal and they decided to run the story. So they ran the story for a week. Uh, the, Daily, uh, the news of the world then came along on Friday and said, well, the Daily Mail got it wrong. So we've got to run the story. So not only did they get a trade off on the previous Sunday, the following Sunday, they ran the story in full. And that is the genesis of why royals must do one thing or the other, be in as a royal full time or be out as a commercial person. There are no halfway points. And the Queen learned a very harsh lesson then. I'm going to get more into the sting in just a moment, but I think leading into that, Dad, and, and this really does feed into your point about how it's very difficult. You cannot, as a working member of the royal family, have a commercial entity running alongside it. And that was really sort of the downfall of Ardent Productions because, um, and we will come back to, to Sophie in just a moment, um, because that was an important part of her journey into to the royal world. But uh, Edward, there was an agreement in place when Prince William was at university at St. Andrews to not go and cover. There were, uh, the press had said, we will hold off. We won't be in the town taking loads of video image if, of course, you give us uh, a few tidbits of information along the way. And this agreement had held pretty fast. So, of course, it went over, forgive the expression, but like a cup of cold sick, when Prince Edward's team were seen up there filming Prince William. It went against everything that had been put in place. There were accusations of special favours and really that led to the downfall if you will of Ardent Productions. Yeah if I can come in there um, what happened was that the press were given a facility of William arriving at St Andrews they then had the, the facility they were then going away and Edward was involved in a documentary at the time which he'd sold to one of the channels in the United States uh, and they decided to stay up there and do some filming not outside the university it has to be said but in St Andrews um, the media sort of harumphed and hard and said, how can this go on? I had already retired from, the, from Buckingham Palace, but I was taken on by Ardent as a consultant. And because they had gone against what had been agreed in the media, I said, look, if you can't play by the rules, there's no point me staying here. And I didn't. 
Uh, so I resigned from that. But it was a hard lesson to learn. He did complete the documentary and then he shut up shop. Let's get into a little bit about this thing. I don't want to harp on it too long. It was many, many moons ago. And to be frank, Sophie has done phenomenal work on the on the royal front ever since. Um, I think she learned a very harsh lesson. She learned it quickly and decisions were made and, and she has made a success of her role. But this thing that we are talking about, there are going to be people that are watching right now who have never heard of it. Um, Diana, Princess of Wales, got caught in a sting, as did the Duchess of York. Uh, even the Queen got caught in a sting. People like to do pranks. They are cruel, uh, they're humiliating, all the rest of it. But Sophie got duped by uh, someone pretending to be a sheikh who was going to, it was cash for access. You run through it, Dad. It was all a bit murky and a bit yucky, but ultimately Sophie got recorded making a couple of disparaging remarks about Sherry Blair, the wife of former Prime Minister Tony Blair. She apparently, although Buckingham Palace denied it, referred to the Queen as an old dear. I'm not sure that's offensive to anyone. A lot of people would have called her an old dear, but it is disrespectful when you're talking about the reigning British monarch. Um, so let's, we're not going to get too heavily into this, but it is an important part of Sophie's journey. It is a very important part of Sophie's journey. She learned a very bitter lesson from that, not only having done an interview with the News of the World and these banner headlines, which really uh, were, were quite meaningless. I don't know why they read, ran that headline. And then seeing the story of her being duped by the fake sheikh the whole week um, by, by another newspaper and then seeing... Uh, the News of the World, the very paper you had given an interview to, run the story in full. Uh, and she learned a very bitter lesson. And it wasn't long after that that she closed up her public relations consultancy uh, and became a full-time royal. And she's been doing some incredible work since becoming a full-time royal. Both she and Edward, they're unsung heroes, quite frankly. They don't get covered a lot by the press. Very occasionally, the Duchess of Edinburgh will get covered. She got covered only a few days ago with a message um, to a Ukrainian women's conference on, on abused women, uh, which went down very well in Ukraine. But she does do an incredible job. And she goes to countries on the African continent um, and in the Arabian Peninsula that a lot of people wouldn't dream of going to. Uh, but she does it because she is very passionate about the organisations that she represents. I want to get more into that because actually it is very meaningful work. And as you say, she was the first royal to have gone to a number of those, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, she really put it on the map in terms of what's happening in a war torn area, sexual violence. Uh, so I think it's important we touch on that. First of all, we're just going to rewind a little bit because as you rightly mentioned, Dad, um, people struggle to understand why can't members of the royal family have a commercial side and the royal side and they just don't go hand in hand at all and another shining example of that is 1987 it's a royal knockout this idea was prince edward's idea he was really excited about it and to be fair he did end up raising 1.5 million pounds for charity, which was an extraordinary achievement. At the time, the Queen was said to be against it. Every courtier at Buckingham Palace was said to be against it. The Prince and Princess of Wales, then Charles and Diana, probably quite wisely said they were not going to take part. But he managed to secure some pretty impressive celebrities. There was Christopher Reeve, Meatloaf, uh, Jane Seymour, Krista Burr, Margot Kidder. Um, but it was the sight, really, of members of the royal family, Princess Anne, Anne, Prince Andrew and uh, Sarah Ferguson, then Duchess of York, were all team captains and they were leaping around in mock Tudor costumes and throwing wedges of ham and dressed as leeks. And it was really just seen as a bit unseemly. And there was a public from uh, a backlash from the British public because they're like, this is what we're paying for. And suddenly we've got you really just making a mockery of the whole thing. And I think it's probably something that Prince Edward would rather not think on too, too much. But why do you think it was so poorly received. I mean, I'm not just talking a bit of negative press. People were outraged by this. They were outraged by it because their feeling was that members of the royal family shouldn't be doing things like that. There is, there is hopefully, even today, still a mystique about the royal family. And that just went against the grain. And I remember at the time that I was accredited to Buckingham Palace, I was still um, 
a working journalist, but I was accredited to the palace. And I went down uh, to, to where it was being filmed. It was a horrible day. It was windy. It was cold. It was miserable. And you had all these people prancing around in funny costumes. And we in the press, we were stuck in a tent. Uh, we, we were able to watch the proceedings on uh, a closed circuit television, but we weren't allowed out into the grounds to watch it sort of live as it was happening. And after it was all over, this sort of full of hair young Edward had in those days, not unlike today, um, he came in and he, he sat on a chair behind a table on a raised platform looking down on us and we were pretty Brassed off. It's not exactly the word I wanted to use, but this is a family channel, so let's keep the language clean. Um, I was brassed off. There were no refreshments. It was cold. Um, and, and all we had was ourselves to amuse each other, to look at this television screen. And he came, he pranced in, and the first thing he said, which was the wrong thing to say, well, what did you think of it? All enthusiastic. There was dead silence. You could have heard a pin drop. And he said, well, adding to the tension. And with that, he stormed off. And the headline in The Sun the following day, it's a walkout. Um, and he never really lived that down. But I suppose, you know, as the years have rolled by, I mean, that was when 87. Uh, the years have rolled by. Here we are in 2024. Look at what he's doing now. Look what Sophie's doing now. They weren't married, obviously, because they didn't get married until 99. But he's done a tremendous job and he's, he's justified his role now as the Duke of Edinburgh. If I may say, I think in many respects, Sophie was probably the making of Prince Edward. Uh, come, she came from a middle class background, um, very sociable, energetic. She was a self-made woman. She was earning her own living. She was independent. Uh, they met very briefly in 1987, but really their pivotal meeting was in 1993. And they had a very long courtship. He eventually proposed in, uh, I think it was 1998, he proposed in the Bahamas. As you said, they got married in June 1999. And people said that, uh, at, at the time that they were a real love match and really um, quite striking that the press even said that they felt like this marriage was going to stick. And of course, Edward is the only one of the late Queen's four children to have not gone through a separation and divorce. Um, and they really, this year, actually, they'll be celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Their wedding was by royal standards, pretty low key. It was at St. George's Chapel, Windsor, but it was at five o'clock, which was very friendly to global networks. Uh, people didn't have to wear hats. Of course, some of the traditionalists did wear hats. Uh, it wasn't a state occasion, and yet still 200 million people tuned in to watch, which really speaks to uh, the lingering and ongoing fascination with the British royal family. But then when they, they really embraced their royal life in 2002, I think they recognized during the Queen's was it Golden Jubilee in 2002 that they couldn't have their commercial endeavors. Sophie had let go of the PR arm, and I think in the years since it's really suited them both to kind of fly under the radar because they've been able to raise their two children very successfully without prying eyes um they don't have to deal with a lot of the scrutiny from the press and yet they've been able to embrace their charitable pursuits both of them uh, i think they oversee upwards of 70 patronages that really feed into their key interests so sport paralympics um agriculture a lot of work supporting young people sophie has done tremendous work uh, trying to really highlight avoidable blindness. Um, together, I think they're quite a powerful force. And it's only now that people are sort of starting to recognise everything that they've achieved together. They are beginning to recognise, and I suppose this is because uh, the King's uh, off desire uh, of a slimmed-down monarchy. And yes, it is a slimmed-down monarchy, and Edward and Sophie happen to be part of can I dare say, the Magnificent Seven. Um, but they are doing a tremendous job. They are being recognised for it at long last uh, by the British media. But then, you know, the media, desperate for a royal story, haven't got a lot of principles to focus on. To. So Edward and Sophie are within their radar. Uh, and it is important that they do get the sort of publicity, particularly Sophie, with the sort of countries that she goes to that you and I wouldn't want to go to, and I don't think many people would want to go to, certainly if for a holiday, uh, maybe if you're working, perhaps. Uh, but she does highlight uh, sexual abuse. She does highlight blindness in third world countries. Uh, and she does 
highlight the sort of uh, um, abuse to, towards women. It, she's very passionate about this. Um, and it is very important that these things are highlighted and that they are recognised in in newspapers uh, and within the media. I mean, I'm, I'm referring back now to 1997, the beginning of that year, when Diana went to Angola to highlight the problem with landmines. Government's not taking any notice. As soon as she'd been there, they did take notice and they started to do something about it. Now, here we are in 2024 and even before Sophie going to some of these countries, highlighting blindness, highlighting sexual abuse, highlighting violent abuse towards women. Governments and, and people in the, in, in the first world will do something about it. And that's important. If she can do her bit, then it is important that these things are, are, are addressed. Dad, this is, uh, Sophie is actually a massive topic and I think I'm very conscious of time. I think we actually need to do a full show on Sophie because as you say, she recently did deliver a video message um, uh, to Ukraine and, and I think there's a lot coming up from her this year and I'd like to explore that. But there's one quote and then I, I want to wrap up on Edward, but I think this is key to Sophie's success. She said after their son James was born in 2007, she said that she recognized that she had to reduce her expectations expectations of what she could actually do as a member of the royal family. She told the Sunday Times, um, I couldn't turn up at a charity and go, right, I think you should be doing this because that's what I was used to doing in my working life. I had to take a really big step back and go, okay, they want you to be the icing on the cake, the person to come in and to thank their volunteers and funders, not necessarily to tell them how to do it and how to run their communications plan. And that's a big epiphany for someone to have, particularly when they've run their own business and they've been an independent career person who's earned their own living. But I think that's the key to her success. So yes, I think we need to come back and do a full show on Sophie. But really what I want to come sort of full circle with Edward, we talked at the beginning about how he actually did have quite a close relationship contrary to popular belief with his father and we've seen that play out since his father's death because he's taken on a lot of his patronages he was recently named president or um, uh, uh, chief chief uh, person for the royal windsor horse show but it's the duke of edinburgh awards where i think he's really making his mark it was a phenomenal program that was set up by the late duke of edinburgh and it's work that prince edward really is continuing to the benefit of children worldwide not just in the uk uh, this is something that children all across um, uh, Australia, uh, the Far East, uh, Canada, it was in America. I think they've reduced the program here now. But I think that really speaks to um, a wonderful relationship between the two men, but also Edward wanting to continue his father's legacy. Wanting to continue his father's legacy, committed to his father's legacy and not forget, uh, yes, children, but it's young adults going up to the age of 25 who participate. And it doesn't matter where he goes in the world, he attracts a crowd of young people who have done this award, who are doing the award, and perhaps looking forward to taking part in the award. So he's a tremendous advertisement for the Duke of Edinburgh's award uh, scheme. And it's one of those schemes started by his dad. It'll go on and on and on, because that's what young people want to do. They want to be involved, and that gets them involved. I think also Prince Edward is getting uh, his own fan base now because it's been said that he started delivering speeches with that old bit of theatrical flair and razzmatazz. And I think he's really bringing that sense of fun to his royal work as well. So I know when we did our video on the Real Housewives of Buckingham Palace, if you haven't watched it yet, please do see it uh, in the Royal Report uh, YouTube channel. A lot of people said, please do more on Sophie. Well, I think that's what we're going to do because in this discussion just with Dad now, I see there is so much that we can cover with Sophie. So for now, sir, if you're watching, uh, both Dad and I do wish you a very happy 60th birthday. Here's to continued good works and indeed recognition for your good works. If you haven't yet subscribed to Royal Report, please do so. Make sure you ring the bell, click like. Thank you as always for joining us and we'll see you next time right here on YouTube with Royal Report.